Uh, it's time to start this first lecture of today. And it's given by the 2015 Nobel Laureate in Physics. As you all know, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics is all about neutrinos. Neutrinos are the most abundant matter particles in the universe. They are everywhere. This very room is full of neutrinos. If I stretch out my hand, billions of neutrinos pass through it, unfelt and unseen. Neutrinos have no electric charge. They rush through space at close to the speed of light. They pass through the thickest walls, and yet this year's Nobel laureates managed to catch sufficient numbers of these puzzling particles to discover another fascinating property which we didn't know of before. It seems that neutrinos morph when they travel through space. They change identities. And therefore, it's a great honor and pleasure to be able to welcome this year's Nobel laureate in physics, Professor Arthur MacDonald of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory and Queen's University in Canada, who will now tell us how this neutrino metamorphosis was discovered and what it has to do with neutrinos having mass. Please join me in welcoming Professor MacDonald. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and an honor to share the, uh, uh, the stage with my uh, chemistry laureate colleague. And uh, I will speak to you today about uh, uh, the science we did with the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, or SNO. Okay. So I'm not appropriately wired yet. <laughs> Worst problem with your car when they tell you you got transmission problems. So. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> and in that new laboratory, we were able to study uh, things that go beyond uh, the measurements that we made of neutrinos with the uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in the first place. And, uh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me try this carefully. <laughs> okay, and so, uh, um, in fact, in studying these properties of uh, subatomic particles, we really are studying everything that spans the full range of the universe. We're studying everything from the very smallest particles uh, to, in fact, their influence on uh, the full range of uh, uh, of uh, distances within the universe. We'll st I'll tell you about our influence in understanding the sun, and also uh, we have effects that are associated with how structure forms in the universe. Neutrinos have a role to play in that. And so we really are studying uh, science that combines information from astronomy, astrophysics, physics, and we're trying to get a full picture of our universe as broadly as we can. This laboratory that we've created two kilometers underground is uh, the lowest, at present, the lowest ra radioactivity location in a major laboratory in the world because we have shielded out 
cosmic rays by being two kilometers underground and took great care at trying to make it ultra clean. It's uh, equivalent to the sort of things that people do to, to create uh, areas where they can fabricate computer chips uh, without getting any uh, dust in the process. We were worried about dust for similar reasons, uh, radioactivity in our case. You can study some very basic scientific questions if you go to a unique place that gets rid of all the other radioactive background. We've been able to study questions like how do the stars like our sun burn and create basically the elements that we're made of. At the same time, understanding the basic laws of physics, where do neutrinos fit into uh, the uh, most basic laws, <clears throat> and also uh, study the composition of our universe. And uh, for that, we uh, uh, move to some of the future experiments in addition to neutrinos. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about neutrinos. Uh, in our case, neutrinos that come from the sun. We shared this prize uh, with great pleasure with our colleagues from Super Cameo Candy experiment in Japan, they were studying neutrinos that are produced by those same cosmic rays I mentioned uh, that uh, uh, produce uh, different types of neutrinos from the ones we studied in the sun, but we were able to observe properties that were similar in each case and thereby uh, confirm that uh, uh, it's a universal property for neutrinos that they change from one type to another. We were also in our future experiments attempting to study particles that make up what's referred to as the dark matter. I'll explain to you a little later how that comes into our overall understanding of the universe. Uh, they have very similar properties to neutrinos. At one point it was thought neutrinos might make up the dark matter particles that we think are five times as abundant as the particles that make up our ordinary matter. We now know neutrinos are, do have a mass, but the mass is too small to uh, correspond to what's observed as in astronomical measurements. So we're looking for particles that penetrate as neutrinos do, but are much more massive, were created in the original Big Bang. We're also able to look at the rarest forms of radioactivity, a uh, process called double beta decay, which will tell us much more about the, the detailed properties of neutrinos and the fundamental laws of physics. Uh, so as Olga mentioned, uh, neutrinos from the sun are streaming through you right now. If you put your thumbnail out and count to three, there will be 200 billion neutrinos from the sun go through that uh, little square centimeter or so of your thumb. And maybe once in your lifetime, one will stop in your body and change one atom, and uh, that will uh, not really have any effect on you at all, unless, of course, it happens to hit your eyeball, and that eyeball happens to be closed, as some of them in the back may be by now. And, uh, <laughs> then you might see a little flash of light. Otherwise, neutrinos are something that are beyond our experience, and yet they are tremendously influential in terms of the <coughs> evolution of the universe, and we may be able to use them as messengers to understand our universe more completely. There's a wonderful experiment that's being, uh, in which Sweden has a, a very big participation, and that's the ice cube experiment, in which a large uh, volume of ice under the South Pole has been uh, instrumented, and they are using events that happen, bursts of light in that section of ice, to study, uh, using neutrinos, the farthest distance, distant reaches of the universe. Uh, so they really have a new type of telescope that they've created for doing that. In our case, we're looking at the sun. In the middle of the sun, it is so hot that the um, atoms fuse. We have nuclear fusion taking place there, and the process <coughs> that uh, uh, constitutes nuclear fusion produces enormous numbers of neutrinos. I'll talk about that in a little more detail later on. And these neutrinos are such that they only stop if they hit the, s the nucleus of an atom or the electron going around the nucleus head on. And so, as far as they're concerned, matter is open space. They can travel through an amount of lead equivalent to the distance that light travels in a year and only have a 50% chance of hitting anything. So they're enormously difficult to detect. With all our, det I'll show you our detector, it's the size of a 10-story building and we were able to register only one neutrino an hour with that detector. And therefore we have to be very concerned about radioactivity as I'll show you later. So 
<coughs> neutrinos, along with electrons and quarks, are the three basic types of particles we don't know how to subdivide any further. They come in three whimsically called flavors. Nobody's ever tasted one, but electron, mu, and tau neutrinos are uh, what we call them. And uh, <coughs> they are in the standard model of elementary particles, but we have learned things that go beyond the present standard model with respect to neutrinos. They're very difficult to detect, and the standard model actually said that they should not change from one flavor to the other, but they do, and that's what we've observed. If you look at our understanding right now uh, of these particles uh, involving quarks, which are shown here, up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom, and <coughs> uh, neutrinos associated one-to-one -one with different types of electrons and heavier particles similar to electrons, muons and taus, then uh, you have to know that a, a proton that's inside a nucleus and a neutron that's inside a nucleus, nucleus are made of up and down quarks and that the electrons then going around the outside give you an atom. Uh, neutrinos are, really only feel the weak force and gravity and they are produced in some forms of radioactivity. Actually, the next time you eat a banana, the potassium-40 beta decay in that banana is going to be irradiating you with a few more neutrinos. Um, but uh, they're also produced very, very extensively in the nuclear reactions that power the sun. They really occur when, or they're emitted when, a, when one type of quark changes into another. The original standard model, as I said, has no mass for neutrinos and no changing. Uh, we and other experiments, uh, particularly the Super Cameo Candy experiment, have shown that this is not correct. But why should we care? What about neutrinos in terms of uh, their influence in the universe? Why bother studying them? Well, for one thing, uh, we can study the core of the sun using these neutrinos, particularly now that we understand that they do change from one type to the other. We can measure very accurately the reactions that are occurring in the, so in the core of the sun. That's where the majority of the elements, stars like the sun, produce hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, the things that make up us. And in supernova, uh, the remainder of the elements, heavier than iron, are created. Uh, that's a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, process called nucleosynthesis uh, that really is the origin of the majority of the elements uh, in the universe, some of them are produced, of course, in the original Big Bang. So we now know from our measurements that the calculations of the processes of fusion in the core of the Sun, confined by gravity, are calculated with great accuracy. We've been able to measure those with to about 10%. Uh, people on Earth are attempting to do very similar things with respect to fusion power, that is, confine it confine reactions that are similar to what's happening in the sun, in this case with magnetic fields rather than with gravity. And uh, so you start from a knowledge that the basic physics that you're using to try to approach that very valuable applied physics topic for, for uh, mankind are in fact very accurate. And it's a prime example of setting out to understand the laws of physics in detail in order to then be able to make sure you're applying them appropriately when you uh, try to use them for applied purposes. Neutrinos, as I said, can have a substantial influence on uh, how the universe ev evolves after the Big Bang. The, the size of their mass actually can influence the structure of the universe, the formation of stars and galaxies. And of course, as I mentioned, with Ice Cube as a prime example, you can study the far distant parts of our universe by studying very high energy neutrinos because they penetrate and aren't affected by all that <coughs> matter uh, in our galaxy or outside our galaxy. They aren't affected by intergalactic magnetic fields. And so you really are doing straight line astronomy in regions that are far beyond what uh, normal optical astronomy can do. And at energies, uh, billion or more times greater than can be produced in the Large Hadron Collider here on Earth. But in doing these measurements, we're very conscious of the fact that we are standing on the shoulders of giants, as has been said. I think it was uh, Newton that used that phrase in the first place. And here are a couple of those giants, Hans Bethe, who developed the basic theory of the sun, and, and Willie Fowler, who really developed all of the theory for how 
those elements from which we're made are produced in stars uh, and uh, supernova. And I'm very proud to say that I, I worked in his laboratory when I was a graduate student at Caltech at the, in the late 60s, 1960s. <laughs> These are two other pioneers. Ray Davis was Nobel laureate in 2002 for his pioneering work in studying uh, astrophysics uh, using particles, in this case neutrinos from the sun. And John Bacall, who uh, developed very accurate calculations for <coughs> how the sun burns, the same ones I was referring to a moment ago. Another pioneer was Bruno Pontecorvo, who first suggested flavor change or oscillation of electron neutrinos, and in 1968 proposed, at that time, muon neutrinos were known to be another type of neutrino, and he proposed that perhaps the reason for why Davis's measurements with a large tank of chlorine showed three times fewer than the calculations was because the electron were, neutrinos were changing into another type, and that would not have been observed. Those muon neutrinos would not have been registering events in the uh, experiment that Davis was doing. And so <coughs> the chain of nuclear reactions that uh, Beta proposed and, uh, and Fowler studied in, in greater detail are shown here. You start with a couple of protons and you end up with uh, helium-4 produced, and in the process you've produced energy and a number of neutrinos. The highest energy neutrinos, the boron-8, well, almost the highest energy, there are a few of these as well that are a little higher, but they're not very abundant. Uh, these uh, uh, neutrinos are what was used by uh, other experiments in the past. They, they dominate uh, Davis's measurements. Uh, but in 1984, Herb Chen, a professor at University of California in Irvine, proposed that perhaps there might be enough heavy water in Canada to be able to do an experiment. Uh, you'd need thousands of tons. <clears throat> and we were actually able to borrow a thousand tons from the uh, nuclear, uh, from, the, from the agency that was developing nuclear power for the so-called CANDU nuclear reactors that use heavy water as a way of slowing down the neutrons to produce the next reaction in the chain, uh, so-called moderator. That's worth $300 million, so it was no trivial thing to uh, convince people to loan it to us, but fortunately, the heads of these agencies were scientists with curiosity, and they really were interested in using this, uh, or allowing us to use this to do what was clearly a very fundamental measurement. It turns out that if you have heavy water, and I'll show you it in more detail, you can not only observe the type of neutrinos produced in the core of the sun, but you can also observe with equal sensitivity all neutrino types. And so a, a direct comparison between the electron neutrinos that have survived and the total number reaching your detector is a clear indication that neutrinos have changed their flavor if you observe uh, there to be fewer <laughs> electron neutrinos. That's what we observed, and it also gives us a way of understanding how many of these <coughs> neutrinos from boron decay in the sun uh, are being produced, and we are thereby testing solar models. So Herb Chen is shown in this uh, next slide, uh, taken in 1986. We started in 1984, and uh, the, we had 16 people in the first place. Uh, Herb was the first spokesman in the United States. He was, uh, <coughs> his other co-spokesman in Canada was George Ewan, who had located an ideal location uh, in a mine owned at that time by International Nickel. It's now owned by Valet, a Brazilian company. But uh, the combination of those two spokesmen uh, got us started. Uh, a year later, they were joined by David Sinclair as a UK spokesman. Unfortunately, and you can see how young Herb is in this photo, he passed away six months later from leukemia. And uh, we, we, we remember him uh, as our founder of this experiment. Um, I was at Princeton at the time, and I, I took over as the U.S. spokesman when he passed away, and then in 1989 moved back to Canada and became the overall director of the project. So we started with 16 people. Uh, what we wanted to study was this process where those neutrinos strike a detector deep underground in order to uh, restrict radioactivity. And from the very beginning, we knew that it was going to be difficult because we only expected about one neutrino burst uh, 
uh, an hour where the neutrino interacts with the heavy water and produces a burst of light. How does it do that? Well, uh, starting with the uh, <coughs> properties of heavy water, which, by the way, is, uh, I mean, you're drinking heavy water every day, <laughs> a little bit diluted. Uh, one in 7,000 of the water molecules you drink are, um, are in fact, uh, heavier because there's an extra neutron in the hydrogen nucleus. And uh, it, it has essentially no effect on the chemistry because it is the proton that defines the chemistry of hydrogen. Mind you, there are small differences. If you want, you can get on the web pure D2O, which is a beauty aid, apparently. You spray it on your face, and uh, it uh, has different properties from water. It, it turns out it does evaporate a little bit slower. It's about a triple O one percent difference, but accuracy in advertising, you get that spritzer, you're going to have a, an improvement in the uh, use of it in, uh, as a spritzer spraying your face. The first reaction that I mentioned that has electron neutrinos uniquely is one in which that electron neutrino changes at the extra neutron, this is the important part of our sensitivity with heavy water, changes that extra neutron into a proton uh, and a very fast moving electron. And fast moving electrons in water produce a process that's like a sonic boom, except it's an electromagnetic process that produces a cone of light in the forward direction. And uh, we set up our detector to observe those cones of light. The other reaction in which uh, a an, any type of neutrino comes in and basically just breaks apart deuterium into a neutron and a proton produces a free neutron in the heavy water. And actually, heavy water is uh, very good from the point of view of not uh, uh, grabbing those neutrons. That's why it's used as a moderator in the Kandu reactor. So those neutrons make their way through the water. And we had three different ways of detecting them. I'll show you them in a moment. But we could detect those neutrons, again, by the production of light in two of the three ways. And we could distinguish those two processes. Comparing those two reactions, as I said earlier, tells you whether the electron neutrinos have changed into the other type, any other type. You have to control radioactivity extremely carefully because there are processes involving gamma rays. Any gamma ray greater than 2.2 MeV can, in fact, knock deuterium apart, photo disintegration, it's called, and they get a, you get a free neutron. So we had to control the radioactivity, ultimately, we controlled it to uh, more than a factor of three, less than our actual rate, and we measured it to 30%. And combine those two uncertainties, and you have or those two facts, and you have a 10% uncertainty only in how many of those uh, neutrons we observed came from, in fact, radioactivity rather than neutrinos. There's one other process, <clears throat> which is the one, in fact, that. React that, that detectors using water can use to study solar neutrinos, and Super Cameo Candy did this, and that is a process in which you have elastic scattering of a neutrino off of an electron, and that again produces a fast moving electron with a chunk off light production. This is <clears throat> true for all neutrino types, but it's enhanced by a factor of six for electron neutrinos, and so it is predominantly a process that, uh, again, is uncertain with respect to if you look at solar neutrinos with respect to whether the numbers in the first place were uh, incorrect for the sun or whether you've had a transformation. Um, I'll mention later how we use this together with snow data. We had three different ways of detecting the neutrons. In the first part of the uh, running of the experiment, we simply uh, allowed the neutron to capture in heavy water. It's not a high efficiency for observing those neutrons, but it produces a six million electron volt uh, <clears throat> gamma ray, which uh, produces uh, uh, electrons, fast moving by the Compton scattering, and you can see a, uh, uh, a trunk off light cone from that. If you put salt in, you increase the efficiency for capturing by a substantial amount, and you get a very isotropic distribution of these light emitting events compared to the rather direct Cherenkov cone that you get for the other reaction that's specific to electron neutrinos, and we could therefore separate explicitly these two processes. And finally, to separate those processes very explicitly, we put in about 200, 400 meters 
of very low radioactivity proportional counters filled with helium-3, a very good way to observe neutrons. And so we had essentially a separate detector inside our detector for that second process dominated by neutrons. I should say, because I'm using the terms repeatedly, that for the electron neutrinos, it's referred to as a charge current reaction. And so I'll use the term CC. And for all neutrino types, I'll use the term NC for neutral current. So that's the shorthand for the future. So here's what the detector looked like. <clears throat> it had a, first of all, it was uh, down two kilometers. It was about 34 meters high. It was in a cavity which had been lined with a watertight and radon tight um, plastic. Uh, we then had inside that a sphere with 10,000 light sensors looking in at a acrylic bubble, a plexiglass bubble that uh, had uh, a 12 meter diameter and about five centimeters thick. And actually my colleague Davis Earle, who's, who's here, who in the past has spent a, a short sabbatical here at Uppsala University, was a principal person in the uh, development of this uh, very unique device. Um, it's uh, essentially uh, uh, a little transparent, a big transparent Christmas ornament to hold the heavy water in the middle. And all of the rest of that volume you see there is filled with ordinary water, albeit ultra pure water uh, in the outer volume, about, uh, in this case, 7,000 uh, kilograms and uh, tons, pardon me, and in the middle here, about 1,000 tons of heavy water with this. Uh, 300 million uh, value on loan for 10 years for a dollar. That's pretty good uh, in any market. <laughs> uh, the radioactivity was graded from the outside to the inside. Uh, the, uh, almost anything, including rock, has about a part in a million uranium and thorium. And it is those uranium and thorium decays that give us the gamma rays greater than 2.2 million electron volts to possibly break apart the, uh, the deuterium. Here it's about a part in 10 to the sixth, uh, graded in, in all cases, being very careful about materials, uh, until in the middle of the detector it's about a part in 10 to the 15 of uranium thorium, about a billion times purer than ordinary tap water. And everyone coming in to work in this area changed clothes to lint-free clothing. We, we maintained a class 2000, as it's called, or better, uh, uh, cleanliness inside. Uh, the whole uh, region as we were building the detector, and we now do that in our, our entire laboratory. So we had no more dust than you could pile on your thumbnail on all the million parts of the detector. And as I said, we only were a factor of three lower <laughs> with our radioactivity levels compared to our signal, but we measured that very accurately. But you can see how essential it was to have done the experiment very, very carefully over a number of years. This is the outline of the mine, <coughs> and we are two kilometers down in, in a mine where they are taking about 5,000 tons of ore a day out of the other side of the same shaft that we travel in. But they've been wonderful to us, Inco and now Valet. We are able to benefit greatly from the fact that they are operating this mine. Helps us a lot in, in our operating costs and uh, they are uh, uh, very, very helpful to us over many years. So uh, to build this detector, we had to bring everything down in that shaft. And the shaft is, is such that the, the mine cage we're bringing people and equipment down in is uh, uh, about a little bit smaller than the size of this stage, about three meters by three meters by four meters. So everything had to be cut into pieces. The acrylic sphere that uh, uh, Davis was working on was uh, cut into a, a 120 pieces and glued together individually underground. This shows you the final uh, gluing pattern, and this shows you uh, the final object. It shows you the light sensors looking in at it, and this is the back of the light sensors. We estimated about 70,000 showers over the course of the, of the project, except for one person. <laughs> when Stephen Hawking visited, <laughs> we vacuumed him off before he I came underground, and Inko built a, a special rail car for him. And uh, uh, he, he's a tremendously inspiring individual. He uh, 
uh, asked lots of questions of our graduate students when he visited back in 1998. He came back in 2012, <coughs> and uh, this was just after he had survived pneumonia earlier in the year. He came in the fall, and uh, he uh, went underground and uh, saw our new laboratory, and uh, really has been an inspiration to everyone that sees him, both for his science, but also for his personal uh, drive. You can see that uh, this is, the laboratory is kept very clean. Uh, this is David Sinclair, who was responsible for our radioactivity in the water systems, and uh, I, the uh, whole purification process accomplished what we needed to do. That billion times cleaner means that in a ton of water you had only one radioactive disintegration per day. And so that's uh, pretty good in terms of avoiding background. So the data we observed <coughs> when we looked at this first process in which we have 6.25 6 MeV gamma rays indicating this neutral current reaction for all neutrino types, it gave us a, uh, a signal which is in this region here. The other process, the so-called charged current process, is essentially reproducing the spectrum of a lot of neutrinos emitted by boron-8 decay in the sun. That particular process of, uh, with the deuterium gives you almost one-to-one -one the energy relationship. So we did a test of what we saw in the summed data here, a hypothesis test of whether it was possible that neutrinos did not oscillate before they reached our detector, and the answer was that there was less than 5.3 standard deviations uh, in terms of, uh, uh, rather greater than 5.3 standard deviations indication that they had changed in type. In other words, less than one chance in 10 million that they had not changed their type. The best fit for the data was, in fact, one in which the electron neutrinos were one-third of the total, as represented by the neutral current reaction. And the neutral current reaction fit very well the calculations of the, the solar models uh, at that point, predominantly by John Bacall and his co-workers. And so two-thirds of the neutrinos had changed from the electron neutrinos to mu or tau neutrinos. The shape for the uh, 6.25 MeV gamma rays I mentioned is basically shown uh, in, uh, uh, pardon me, in this curve here, where we produced a gamma-emitting material, transported it to the center of the detector, used a device that enabled us to cover uh, about 80% of the total internal volume uh, by moving around. This is not to scale, but we had a device that looked like this that enabled us to move all our calibration devices inside the detector to map it out. Uh, and so uh, that's one calibration we did. Uh, we also did a high energy calibration, and we calibrated exactly what a neutron looks like when it cap captures in the detector. So we understood our calibrations very well. We also used radioactive sources to see what the response to them is. And when we analyzed the data from the radioactive sources, we found that there's actually a different in the difference in the isotropy of the events on our light sensors, uh, such that we could, uh, on, a, on a statistical fitting, tell the difference between, or well, tell the ratio of uranium and thorium in our normal uh, events. These are calibration uh, curves. Uh, here you see our goal in order to achieve that three times smaller than the signal. We were well below that in our actual measurements that are also recorded on these graphs for radon, radium, and uh, the radium associated with uranium and the radium associated with thorium. We degassed the uh, heavy water throughout the experiment to get rid of radon. And so eventually, uh, we then went to the second stage and put sodium chloride in. And as I said, the efficiency goes up to 40%. So you put sodium chloride in, and suddenly this curve in here, representing the capture of, uh, of uh, the neutron, becomes, goes up to here. The charge current doesn't change. But you see uh, a much greater sensitivity. And, and also, by using this information about the isotropy of the events, we could actually tell independently those two reactions. What I'm showing you here is the fact that back in 1987, uh, we did a, a simulation of what we might see in this detector with, at that point, we were trying to choose how many light sensors to use and a variety of other uh, 
parameters of the detector. This is what we simulated as to what the charge current and neutral current would look like. Uh, there's a, a large radioactive background that starts over here, just below here. That's shown here. And you can see that there's a great similarity between what we, <laughs> amazingly, what we told the agencies we could do and what we ended up doing. <laughs> So uh, we said at that time, if we can manage all of these technical things, it's possible to make this measurement, and here's what the data will look like. And lo and behold, in 2002, this is actually what it looks like. Actually, this was a little later than 2002, more like 2004. If you look at the results after we had put the salt in, where we now were measuring independently the uh, charge current and neutral current uh, fluxes of neutrinos, numbers of neutrinos striking our detector. You can make a plot in which the sensitivity of those reactions to muon and tau neutrinos uh, on that axis and electron neutrinos on this axis. Of course, charge current is only sensitive to electron neutrinos. It's straight up. No sensitivity to mu and tau. The uh, neutral current has this sensitivity. Where they cross is where you would expect the ratio of the two to be, be defined. defined. And by that point, we had uh, greater than seven standard deviations indication that neutrinos had, in fact, changed their type. And we had a very accurate measurement via the, the uh, salt measurement of the neutral current reaction of the total number of neutrinos from the sun. And this is to be compared with calculations by two uh, very knowledgeable people about the, the so solar physics, John Bacall and Sylvain Cherk Chies. And you can see that uh, the in point of fact, the accuracy of the measurements is slightly better than the accuracy of the theory at this point. And in fact, they're, they're guiding the theory a little bit right now, and we would like to do some future measurements of other reactions in the sun to try to learn more about the uh, uh, physics of what's happening in the sun. In the later phase of the project, we put 400 meters of neutron counters in. We put them in using a, a uh, <coughs> remotely uh, a, a small submarine, uh, nobody over 23 was capable of doing this, <laughs> we discovered, partly because they were the, the, uh, the generation that did all those video game <laughs> type of things, and partly simply because the other people were older. Uh, so we trusted all our young people to put these uh, uh, neutron detectors in our 300 million bucks worth of heavy water. You can see what was done. Hamish Robertson led this, uh, this team. Uh, there's the submarine, kind of a old, uh, 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 ordinary green color. It wasn't in the first place. We had a choice of what color to paint our submarine. What would you paint your submarine if you had a choice, of course? <laughs> we all wanted to live in a yellow, with a yellow submarine, so we painted it yellow. Only problem is that stuff was really radioactive. <laughs> so <laughs> we had to strip it all off again, and we ended up with that prosaic-looking uh, submarine, but it worked, and we ended up with a good detector, and in fact, uh, people worked very hard and were able to tell the difference between uh, alpha particle decay from, from radioactivity on the walls of those detectors, which had, uh, in their, their pulse shape was different from what you would observe from, from neutrons, and we used pulse shape to do an ultimate analysis of all three phases of the uh, experiment. This is our final result for the total number of uh, neutrinos from the sun uh, due, due to, to boron-8 boron decay, and, and this, this is, is our final, final result for the ratio of electron neutrinos to all neutrino types. So, of course, we were not the only ones doing solar neutrino measurements. Uh, we started in 1984. At that time, there was only the chlorine experiment, uh, which is shown here on a plot of the fluxes, uh, numbers uh, uh, per uh, square centimeter per second per MeV increment here. Uh, and you can see the units, uh, 10 to the 10 <laughs> in those units, for the very lowest energy neutrinos in the PP reaction. Uh, Bacall, or rather, uh, um, Davis's experiment had a threshold here and observed everything above that starting in 1968, and that was the first indication that there was a problem. We started in 1984. By 1989, when we obtained our funding, uh, Cameo Kanda, the, the initial experiment, had a measurement that also showed a deficit in those neutrinos, a slightly different value, um, but, but also a deficit. Again, sensitive primarily just to the type produced in the core of the sun. And then the, uh, the SAGE, uh, Soviet-American gallium experiment, and the uh, uh, 
Galax slash GNO experiments made measurements that again showed a, a deficit. And then we came in at uh, 2001 with a, a threshold about here as well that was sensitive primarily to boron-8. If you put that on a plot of measurements relative to the predictions of the standard uh, theory for the sun, uh, that's shown as one, there was only, there was a factor of two, too few when you looked at the lowest energy neutrinos, uh, the factor of three for the chlorine measurements of Davis, Super Cameo Candy had also come in with a factor of three. People still weren't sure whether it was those calculations or whether it was a change in type. And so our measurements ended up showing uh, even fewer uh, of the uh, uh, electron neutrinos than Super Cameo Candy had shown for exactly the same uh, source, that is boron-8 neutrinos. Uh, in fact, that's because they had a little extra sensitivity to all neutrinos, uh, in addition to electron neutrinos, and all our measurements of the total neutrino type uh, were up in agreement with theory, and it's clear that there was a big difference between the number of electrons surviving and the total. Of course, <coughs> these neutrinos, and, and that essentially defined our contribution to understanding that solar neutrinos change their type. But there are many neutrinos, uh, not just the ones from the sun that are going through you right now. They come from other sources. They come from the production in the atmosphere that Super Cameo Candy used so effectively for their measurements of neutrinos oscillating as they cross the Earth. Uh, they come from all of the supernova that have taken place since day one. There are even some left over from the Big Bang, but they're so low in energy, nobody has ever figured out a way to try to measure them. Uh, these are the set of neutrinos from the sun. When a supernova goes off, all of a sudden there's a spike of neutrinos that in terms of rate is about a million times any one of those rates, but well, in particular solar neutrino rates, but it only lasts for about 10 seconds. However, it was observed back in 1987, that's what Professor Professor Koshiba received the Nobel Prize for uh, back in 2002, along with Professor Davis. So what does this oscillation mean in terms of the basic physics? I'm going to get a little bit more technical now for the physicists in the audience. I apologize to those who are not that there are equations. This is an equation alert, okay, <laughs> on the next slide. Um, the, the idea is that in quantum mechanics, uh, you have... Uh, the possibility that the eigenstates that are produced, the states that are produced when an, when an electron neutrino is produced or a muon neutrino or a tau neutrino is produced, are not one-on-one, -on -one, one to one with the mass states. And it turns out that the kinematics of the, the, of the what happens in quantum mechanical sense as the, uh, uh, as the neutrinos travel depend upon what mass state they're in. And so if they if they travel uh, some distance, then uh, these, these mass states, these color mass states, are being affected differently. And the next time you ask, do I have an electron neutrino there, then you are going to try to say, to what degree do these changed states look exactly like this thing that looks like an electron neutrino with that set of ratio of masses? And the answer is it's changed. And there are more of the uh, other types of neutrinos. If you put that on a mathematical basis, as uh, was done by combining the work of Pontecorvo and uh, <coughs> Maki Nakagawa and Sakata, and talk about the fact that we know there are three uh, neutrinos and, and that you can express the flavor states in terms of the mass states with a matrix. This matrix is uh, three by three, but it breaks down into three different components, and, or many different components, and it turns out that uh, in fact, they split into the types of experiments. Uh, atmospheric neutrinos, as observed by Super Cameo Candy and others, uh, give you <coughs> those parameters to understand how this oscillation is taking place in detail. Uh, those are sines and cosines of angles that end up showing up in a oscillatory pattern, uh, which is dependent upon the difference in mass between uh, two masses that turn out to dominate the uh, particular cases we're dealing with here uh, in the various experiments, and the distance over which the neutrinos have traveled and inversely proportional to their energy. 
So we have finite measurements for atmospheric neutrinos, for solar neutrinos. I've just showed you some of them. Those have been confirmed by experiments with reactors. And uh, in each case, we've been able to define the difference in mass using this formula. We now know the difference in mass between one, mass 1 and mass 2 and mass 2 and mass 3. Uh, we also now have a final me uh, measurement to fill in these cosines and sines, uh, which was made by, uh, again, reactor measurements predominantly and also accelerator measurements. What we don't know is the uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry associated with neutrinos, which can end up making differences uh, depending on the value of this uh, uh, phase that comes into this equation. And similarly, if you have, uh, well, up to this point, we're dealing with the oscillation process. If you go into a process I'll mention later called double beta decay, you get two more of these phases showing up. There are, there's a big puzzle as to why in the early universe you made equal matter, amounts of matter and antimatter because you started with energy, and that's the way in which conversion of energy occurs. Equal numbers of neutrinos and antineutrinos, for example. But somehow the antimatter has all decayed away. And it is thought that one of the pro ways in which this could occur are processes that uh, arise from neutrinos. And so trying to understand these effects are important for the future. And so measurements to try to get at this particular uh, quantity are a part of the future. There's another effect that happens in the sun where if the neutrinos interact with the very dense electrons, you can have a resonant process. And in fact, if you look at all of the measurements that have been made so far for neutrinos and, their, and, and what you expected for the different reactions and therefore the different energies and what was observed using, again, this, uh, this prediction from the solar models, you find that, in fact, what appears to be happening is that the electron neutrinos produced in the core of the sun through a resonant process end up leaving the sun in a pure mass two state. And you remember I said that the traveling of neutrinos depends upon their mass properties. And so they basically stay the same as they come out of the surface of the sun. And we detect that uh, in our detector. In the process, we determine this difference in mass between mass one and mass two. And we determine this, this angle that goes into the overall understanding, but we also know that mass 2 is greater than mass 1. You can learn that if there's an interaction with matter. And in fact, the ice cube experiment and one of the things they're proposing to do to upgrade the experiment has the possibility of doing the same thing for atmospheric neutrinos, where the interaction in this case would be the difference between those atmospheric neutrinos going through the outer part of the Earth or going through the core. And this is a, a big objective because we know uh, when we look at uh, neutrino masses that mass 2 is greater than mass 1. We don't know where mass 3 is relative to the other two. There have been some beautiful oscillation patterns to show that it is neutrino oscillation made in a number of experiments. This is what was observed with Super Kamiokande and was shown by Professor Kajita uh, in his Nobel lecture. It has also been observed for reactor neutrinos and for accelerator neutrinos. The question of whether such transformations imply that neutrinos have a finite mass is uh, perhaps most simply discussed in terms of the fact that uh, if the neutrinos were traveling at the speed of light, they would not be able to have uh, in their frame of reference elapsed time that allows these obviously time-related oscillation processes to take place. So the fact that they're taking place means that they're not traveling at the speed of light and therefore have a finite mass. So we know a lot about neutrinos. Uh, we know they're these parameters I was discussing. We don't yet know whether the sequence of masses looks like this or looks like this, depending upon the size of mass 3 relative to the others. There have been a tremendous number of experiments over many years. Uh, and the ones that showed finite effects have ended up showing, in, concentrating in these two areas that I mentioned earlier on. Now, <clears throat> we have still some puzzles. I mentioned that we don't know where all the antimatter went. We think we can observe that with respect to measurements of this very rare radioactive process called neutrinoless double beta decay. Uh, 
We don't know what the absolute mass of the neutrino is, and therefore we don't really know how later on in the universe, as structure started to form, uh, they are influencing that structure. We also have a lot of known unknowns in terms of what the composition of the universe is. We know that uh, we are only about 4% of the total. A lot of this information comes from things like cosmic microwave background information, large-scale structure, astronomical and astrophysical measurements. We know, and the, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded several years ago for measurements in which we know that the universe is actually expanding, that there's a, a repulsive term in, uh, in Einstein's uh, gravity. Um, and so we know that dark matter is on the order of 26%. If that dark matter wasn't there, our galaxy would fly apart. Uh, the speed of the stars and the outer regions of our galaxy is such that you need about five times as much non-glowing material to hold it together compared to what you observe glowing. There are a lot of experiments all over the world attempting to address these very fundamental questions, including dark energy. We have an opportunity with our new laboratory, particularly to focus in on this rare process of neutrino to stubble beta decay and uh, the process of dark matter detection. You can see we have quite a large additional area here. We are actually outfitting, we're, we're refitting the snow detector to be something called Snow Plus, in which we replace the heavy water with other uh, material. There are a number of experiments in this area over here, which observe, with using different techniques, uh, uh, attempt to observe the dark matter process, including an experiment called DEEP, using a large amount of liquid argon that's going to turn on in the next couple of months. It's one that I have a particular interest in. Uh, in which we hope to get about 10 times the sensitivity that people have had so far for observing dark matter particles. Uh, the set of experiments include putting liquid scintillator in uh, the snow experiment and then dissolving in it one of the more favorable nuclei for this very rare radioactive process in which two neutrinos could be emitted but are not emitted because neutrinos turn out to actually I mean, this is what could be the case. This is what we're trying to seek. Neutrinos could be their own antiparticle, and so they could be reabsorbed as they're about to be emitted, and so no neutrinos come out. And if that's the case, you get a very monoenergetic uh, uh, signal if you look at both neutrino sum together. That would be very relevant if we observed that in terms of trying to place neutrinos within theories that extend the standard model. We know that they don't that the standard model as presently structured, the Higgs mechanism and so on, does not provide finite mass for neutrinos. And so we have a, perhaps a window into uh, something beyond what we already know in the universe uh, for neutrinos. And if they are Majorana particles, we can also measure their absolute mass. And we have a set of experiments looking at uh, dark matter as well. Uh, here are the set of uh, agencies that supported us in the different countries and the many different institutions that uh, were uh, the, the, the home institutions for the 262 authors. Uh, you can't uh, read all of these, uh, but uh, the emphasis is that there was a very large number of people to whom I'm enormously grateful for all the work that went into our success, including 11 who have passed away, including our, one of our founders, Herb Chen, that I mentioned earlier on. And uh, so uh, with that note, I'll stop and say uh, this is a major international success story, and uh, we're very, very proud of, uh, of how we've been able to work together over many years to make something like this happen. Thank you very much.